When you actually ask, if you actually ask a white person, you ask them, most white people in America, you say, okay, so what's your ethnicity? I'm white. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm asking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, what is your, like, do you know your ethnic background? Like your mm -hmm. ancestors? They're like, actually, I never really even thought about it. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. No wonder, like, they, of course, they culturally appropriate, coarsely racially appropriate. Mm -hmm. They've been expected to erase their ancestral identity from the beginning. You are listening to the Holistic Life Navigation Podcast. I am your host, Luis Mojica. I'm a holistic therapist, and my goal is to teach people how to find safety in themselves. I use nutrition, herbalism, self-inquiry, and somatic therapy to heal the body and mind of trauma. I have learned that each and every one of us has the ability to heal, to love, and to access all of the answers we're looking for. To do this, we first need to learn how to listen to our bodies and understand our minds. Let us begin. So before you hear the episode, I'm just letting everyone know that this work is, in my opinion, so vital. It's vital for black people, and it's vital for white people. It's vital for yellow people. It's vital for human beings because it's a human issue because it involves trauma and trauma is in the nervous system. Every human being has a nervous system. So this work that April does that you're about to hear is, in my opinion, unifying of the human race because it's a human issue because it's a trauma issue. So I hope everyone tuning in opens their minds and their hearts and listens as many times as they need to because it, it's deep and there's a lot of layers. She was so generous with her time. She spoke with me for about two and a half hours. So we've split the interview into two parts. You're about to hear part one and part two will be coming out shortly. So get ready. Here it comes. So, I'm honored to have April Harter here on the podcast. I'm going to introduce her and then she's going to take over. April Harter is a licensed clinical social worker and founder of the Racism Recovery Center in Colorado, where white people can get psychotherapy services to address the underlying traumas that drive their racist behaviors. Her license allows her to only offer therapy if you live in the state of Texas or Colorado. Everyone else will just have to follow her on Instagram and listen to her insightful podcasts. I am enamored by April's take on racism. She is a black woman who provides racism recovery services, mostly for white people who are ready to work on their covert and even overt racism. A recent Instagram post from her asked the question, what would our world be like if racists healed? I want you to take a moment and ponder that for yourself. Ask yourself, what would I be like if I healed my own racist thinking? If I could become enlightened to my own unconscious racist actions? What would my world be like if I was conscious, aware, and no longer feeding the racist system in America, the same system that I completely oppose and disapprove of? April's work is about healing one individual at a time, not by shaming, not by guilting, not by pressuring them to engage in performative allyship, but simply by going within, getting honest with oneself, and learning what drives our racist tendencies, thoughts, and behaviors. Thank you for joining me. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, the first question I have for you is really about you before we get into your work. I want to know anything that you think we need to know about you, how you came to this work, how you decided to do this? Well, when you ask the question about me, I think that <clears throat> it's infor it important for people to know that I think that what makes me very different than a lot of African-American women, a lot of black women, is that I am biracial and my family 
is white, predominantly white. And so what that means is that I can't segregate my whiteness from myself. Mm. I can't distance that. That wouldn't be very healthy of me. So as an individual growing up biracial, kind of like Barack Obama and others who are biracial, right? Yeah. We embody that racial integration. Mm-hmm. And we have to come to terms to that uh, racial development, racial identity development over time in a way that is very healthy and very whole to us. And that is very different than necessarily other black women who do not consider themselves biracial and they may or may not segregate themselves racially from white people. And there's a reason for that because the truth of the matter is, and I say this and it's very painful for white people to understand, but it's the truth. White people essentially cannot be trusted to not act in a racist way if they have not explored their racism. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. there is a belief that white people are like the exception. If I've learned that racism is bad, that I can't possibly act in a racist way, that's just not true. So I think what a lot of, at least within my circles, I think what a lot of black folks do is they go, I'm going to kind of try to stay away from white people in psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. Now, not all. So now back to me and just being a therapist, Mm -hmm. which is that, one of the questions is, as a black therapist, why would you want to be working with white people? Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. that's kind of like a personal question, but also a professional question, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so um, that's because I saw the correlation between what was happening in society on a macro level to the micro level. So then I was treating QTPOC, so queer, trans, and people of color. And those were actually the original people I was treating. Mm. And at the time, I didn't understand that I was actually only treating them. You would, on the surface, oh, yes, you know, like, do it for them. No, yes, do it for them. But there was a deep part of me psychologically going, I want to avoid racists as much as possible. And the way to do that is to, like, only be around my own. Love that. I'm just like, I'm just going to get away from people that aren't like me so that I don't have to be the victim of racism in my own psychotherapy session. Mm -hmm. So this was my own trauma avoidance. This was Mm -hmm. absolutely symptomatic of PTSD, complex PTSD, being the victim of racial trauma. So let's just start there. Like so many people ask me, you know, how in the hell (laughs) do you work with white people? (laughs) Like how, you know, and I couldn't. So the truth of the matter is on a very personal level, and I think a lot of POC, we assume that we don't necessarily need, like, and this is like very hypocritical of me. It's like, well, I don't, I didn't really need treatment for therapy for the racial trauma I've experienced. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm good. Like, I've gotten through this world. I've gotten my degree and I'm a licensed psychotherapist. I don't, I don't need therapy to address my racial trauma, right? Not true. <laughs> <laughs> And actually what happened was, was that I had had therapy before, but I hadn't had healing for the racial trauma. Wow. And like anything else, if you're then working with people who trigger you, that's going to trigger the need for therapy to get treatment for the racial trauma, the complex PTSD. So that's that's what, that's how. I'm able to work with white people. So initially it was like, I'm familiar with white people, a group of white family. I'm not as afraid of them, even though I have been the victim of racism. Um, at the same time, just even looking back on it, on my own journey, I very much kicked into codependency with white people. So mm. it was like, how you does will show hear, up? What did that well, mean? You, It shows up in ways where, and I actually saw this on, um, I saw this actually on NBC News the other day on YouTube. And, um, I can't remember the name of the, the interviewer, but she was interviewing black psychiatrist. I can't remember her name. She was interviewing a black couple and she asked the black couple, like, you know, um, you needed therapy. And then what was that like for you? And they said, well, 
So the wife, she uh, wanted therapy because she was pregnant and she was very stressed out and she was going through life changes and things like that, feeling very overwhelmed. So she wanted to go see a therapist. So she went to go see a white therapist. Um, and so she talked about a lot of things and everything was good. But then when she tried to talk about racism, the white therapist kicked into counter transference, essentially mm. acting in a racist way in the therapy session. And listening to this interview, I heard this black woman say, well, it's really not about color. It's about culture. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. So I heard her and then I, and that's fear, that's trauma, conflict avoidance. And then I heard the husband, he said that he was a recovering alcoholic. He was going to AA meetings and he was the only black guy in the room. It was a men's A group. Mm -hmm. And he said that he wanted to talk about a lot of the different things he was going, going on in his life, including racism. And he, you know what he said? And this was just like, you know, it's sad, but it's true. And this is codependency. He was like, but also trauma, of course. And he said, I felt like I couldn't talk about the racism I've experienced because I didn't want to hurt the feelings of the white people in the room. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Okay. So, Swinging back to me now, growing up with a white family meant I was afraid of calling out their racism yeah. because they're my family members. Yeah. And so that's like conflict avoidance. So that's what happens with POC when they're in predominantly white families or POC that are in predominantly white like institutions or colleges or whatever. Like then it's like you're outnumbered. And then it's like, oh my gosh, if I point this out, I'm outnumbered. And then I, I'm scared. Mm -hmm. so that's trauma. Mm -hmm. So, and you're gaslit and all this other stuff by your own white family members. So, essentially, me going into the work, I hadn't healed from codependency in that regard. And so, not only am I not healed from the trauma of being a victim of racism, but I hadn't healed from the trauma of codependency, which is narcissistic, covert narcissism. And yeah. So those things went down. So when I started to do the coaching, I actually didn't really know until later that these white people actually needed treatment. And then of course I mm. needed treatment too. Mm. And so this was like, I mean, th yeah, this was not easy, this journey at all. See that part you just said at the end, white people needed, needed treatment and I did too. That's, that's what draws me to your work because you say that in your work, you know, you're very, you're very upfront about that, that need for this holistic healing on both sides, which I think is incredible. But as the healer, you've, it's obvious you've done your work, you know, that that comes across. And that's why I wanted to do this interview with you. Because you're, you know, one thing I've experienced, I'm biracial as well, you know, one side Latino, one side white. So yes. I, I'm, definitely have never experienced racism like a person of color has. I'm aware of that. I'm not deluded. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so you, you're not as melanated. <laughs> <laughs> not as melanated. That's exactly right. Right, right, right. right. And yeah. so, you know, yeah. but I say that because I know, and being intersex, you know, I, I know the, how that feels to be between these worlds. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. as a, someone that looks so white, sounds mm -hmm. white and was raised white. Passing. white. Yeah, yeah, very white passing. Mm -hmm. yes. You know, and like, I've been subject in the last couple of months to so much uh, online hate um, mm. around, you know, what am I doing? What, mm. what am I doing? And mm -hmm. I don't, I don't take it personally. I get it. It's trauma response. Mm -hmm. So many people that haven't studied trauma, they don't know that's a threat response. They don't know that this is what's happening here. And I love the work comes back to trauma because it's such a body reflex. It's beyond consciousness. So I'm so interested in you sharing just any any of your insight as we talk today about how these racist tendencies are really trauma responses at, at the end of the day, because mm -hmm. uh, they feel other people see them as choices or we, we want to be this way, especially a covert racist. Yes. It's a trauma response. And so when you're saying about uncovering, like the way you had to do to sit in a room with white people talking about racist behavior, you're the the testament that you can work with people, not take it on. And actually, at the end of the day, create connection. Absolutely. And I wasn't really able to. So one of the biggest ways that I take it on, and like anyone who's experienced trauma recovery, is that 
you're really in tune with yourself and you know when a boundary violation has occurred. You know when it happens. You really, it's humanity. You're going to come across people that try to, I mean, they can't help it. And they mm -hmm. sometimes they do it intentionally and sometimes they do it unintentionally. And you just know that they're trying to cross your boundary for whatever reason they're trying to do that, right? Mm -hmm. And you just go, oh, boundary violation. I need to set a boundary, right? And so when you've been traumatized, and then you get kicked into the enmeshment and all these other things, trauma bonding and all of that, all that not so fun stuff, right? Yep. You're not setting boundaries. Mm -hmm. So when you're dealing with people who struggle with narcissism, right? Um, and I have a very different view of narcissism than I think even a lot of narcissist specialists have. So as a colleague of mine, you know that like I, my specialty is narcissism. Mm -hmm. It's a specific type, a niche within a niche, so to speak. And um, like I said on Instagram, I mean, the, the, the core of narcissism is to numb one's pain. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you, what would you say to people listening about that? Yeah, narcissism? because so a lot of people think that narcissism is just like when we think of narcissist, I mean, it's taboo. Nobody wants to be called a narcissist. Everyone wants to, oh my gosh, I'm not a narcissist because those nobody wants anything to do. There's, these people can't change. They can't heal. Mm -hmm. They can't get better. I mean, there's just all these things that are said about narcissists, right? Okay. But, but this is not actually rooted in like enough understanding. So what, what I want to do is try to bring more understanding to what is really going on with the narcissist. Mm -hmm. Because I see a lot of shaming to the narcissist when in reality, actually, we have a lot more in common with the narcissist because actually many of us don't know. We struggle with narcissism ourselves and mm -hmm. need treatment. We, we need to get those traumas attended to, right? Mm -hmm. So if you Google up or look in the dictionary, the word narcissism, narc is originally a Greek word and it actually means to numb. Mm -hmm. To numb. Mm. I just want to pause and want everyone to feel that. That's powerful. To numb. And so when I saw it, I was like, minute? To numb? That, nobody thinks of narcissism like that. How come mm -hmm. we don't talk about that? Why, mm -hmm. why are we not having this discussion? Mm -hmm. Of course a narcissist is numbing their pain. Because if you numb your own pain, you're not going to understand the pain of another human being. Mm. Now, why would anyone even want to numb their pain? Well, because this gets back to childhood trauma, which is we learn when we're kids that uh, by our parents or caregivers or whatnot, that when we don't, when we get our feelings hurt and we don't get our emotional needs met and that's unresolved and it's a trauma, well, we need to keep moving forward but no closure actually happens, no grief. Because in trauma work, we need to have closure. Mm -hmm. We need to come to that understanding of why did this happen and how did I feel and all that good stuff, right? There's no closure. Mm -hmm. It's just trauma. And so what do we do as children? We compartmentalize, we repress, we suppress, we dissociate to try to survive, and we, we emotionally numb ourselves automatically. I mean, it's an automatic response. Mm -hmm. To survive we go and we kick into fight or flight and those things stay with us we're adults and so what happens is is that we then grow up and really america and many other countries they are absolutely narcissistic in culture what does that mean it means that all of us are trying to numb our pain addiction whatever it might be food might be television might be instagram might be <laughs> You know, anything, okay? Like what that, are we like trying that. to, right? We are trying to numb our pain instead of hold space with it. So for those of you listening, it doesn't mean obviously you can't enjoy it, but you know, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying when you use it in a way we're mm -hmm. trying to bypass feelings, mm -hmm. then we're failing to hold space for our emotional pain. And a lot of the time that's embarrassment, shame, humiliation, right? Mm-hmm. Um, when that's where a lot of your work comes in around, yes. if I haven't held space for my trauma, you know, I can't hold space for yours. So this mm -hmm. is where we get into this, this, like, I love that kind of, I just want to read this mm -hmm. post that you had put up 
a person mm-hmm. of color can hold space for you when they haven't held space for the racial trauma, but call you white and fragile instead. And mm-hmm. then you go on to say, you can't hold space for people of color because you haven't held space for your shame. Guess what? They can't hold space for you because they still fail to hold space for their pain. Now that you or them have healed from a history of trauma. That's so important. It's so important. It's like we're throwing this volleyball on fire back and forth. Yes. And so when you're talking about the narcissist and you're saying, well, you know, that kind of person comes off as really like malicious, greedy, you know, conniving, super ego. But Mm -hmm. it's really just all these trauma responses to avoid feelings. Then you're right. So you have to turn away someone else's pain because you can't handle your own. That's right. You you have to because then you're triggered. So when someone is presenting pain to you, that's like perceived as threat because then it mm-hmm. like causes vulnerability. Mm-hmm. Not a vulnerability means you may actually experience pain. So then you have to turn that off to the best of your ability. And that's when white people react in racist defense mechanisms. Mm. Now, I, I love I love that because I actually listened to, and if you haven't listened to April's podcast, it's Racism Recovery Podcast, correct? Mm-hmm. You have to listen to it because these great like eight minute concise, powerful little bits of medicine. And the one I really, really liked that that hit me the most so far was decentering equals dissociation. Uh, I think, uh, <laughs> I think this is the, you're right. Like this is the time for me to bring it in like that piece. Cause what you're saying, that's what we're talking about, right? Mm-hmm. Like tell, tell everybody, uh, particularly white people who are uh, trying to sit in anti-racist uh, circles. What's that about? You can see me, I'm just like, you know, we're on Zoom and you're just looking at me going, oh. <laughs> So this, I mean, this gets into like the whole myth. So the, I'm at what, Louise, so a lot of what I'm doing is I'm trying to demystify mm. what's actually happening mm. in the interracial dynamic. Like what is happening? Yeah. Right? And so, ah, uh, so decentering. Um, So this is what's actually what a lot of POC anti-racism influencers are actually trying to tell white people, what they actually trying to tell them is stop acting like a narcissist, stop being a narcissist. And the way to do that, stop making it all about you. Mm. If only it were that easy, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. stop narcissism like that. So here's the problem that they don't know and they don't know. And I need for everyone listening, like listen to me while I'm telling you that when you struggle with racism, which is a type of narcissism, you're already decentering yourself. Mm. You're already bypassing your feelings. So then when you decenter yourself more, it, it's just even worse. And that's why mm. white people are like, I am decentering myself. Why do I keep on acting in racist mm-hmm. ways? And I'm like, because it's the opposite of what a narcissist should be doing. Mm. You need to be yeah. actually holding space for that pain. A narcissist is trying to numb the pain. So then what happens is you have people that aren't trauma informed diving into psychology, but they don't know it because the truth of the matter is, is that the work that I'm doing is so fresh and so new that people just don't know about it. And it's Mm going to take time, Mm -hmm. you know, because really, and you and I both know this, we're diving into a brand new field of psychology. Mm -hmm. Bottom line, all therapists will know this. Like, whoa, this is therapists have always tried to figure out how do we deal with racists? Like, I don't even know, like, Mm -hmm. what do we do? You know? And so the, in a way, the worst thing you can do is to decenter yourself. It's like telling someone who's struggling with addiction, like, don't think about your feelings. Don't make it all about you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And just stop drinking. Well, like that's, that's an important, hard. that's a really important analogy. Because when you're saying to someone like with drinking, don't, yeah. th- don't talk about your feelings or feel them. Well, if you're not drinking, the withdrawal is to feel them. Mm-hmm. So if you're in an anti-racist circle, like you're going to start withdrawing from yes. avoiding that, right? And so those emotions are going to be coming up and then you're not allowed to have emotions because you're the perpetrator. Yeah. So it's just, it's a very strange dynamic where, again, what I hear you saying is trauma. It's the, the, the it, let's say there's um, black educators in the room mm-hmm. and they're trying to say, you know, you are fragile. Mm-hmm. You don't want to hold space for your pain. Like that's not what this is about. Mm-hmm. That's their trauma response. Mm-hmm. And then the white people in the room who are saying like, I'm going to fawn, I'm going to freeze, I'm not yes, going to say gonna anything. I'm going to freeze, I'm not going to yeah. say anything. That's right. Which means I disassociate from actually, what, dissociate from what causes my racism. I'm just going to smile and be your ally. It's trauma right. response. And actually today, in as I was 
going through what I'm going through on Crowdcast with the Courage to Trust mm-hmm. by our colleague Cynthia Wall, you know, she wrote that book. We got into the three barriers to intimacy, which is enmeshment, instant intimacy, mm-hmm. and idealizing. And what happened? It's on Instagram. Yes. Enmeshment. Yes. In, so white people are like, I have to have instant intimacy with the yeah. POCs. So I don't look racist. And I'm like, whoa, yeah. whoa, 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 whoa. Like, wait a minute. Like that yes. is actually going to yes. prevent you from having authentic intimacy with a POC. And I asked them, I said, what do you think? And then it kind of, in Cynthia Wall's book, it got into these little concentric circles of intimacy, layers of from soulmate all the way to acquaintance, basically. Mm-hmm. And I said, what do you think that POC want when they say allyship and solidarity? What do you, where do you, in those lines, do you think that is? Mm-hmm. What would you think that is? Oh, acquaintance. No, not acquaintance. More like the next layer, which is, it said companion or coworker. And, mm-hmm. and the word that would go in here is co-conspirator, mm-hmm. right? Because that means you're mm-hmm. doing the work, you're working together, right? I want everyone and, to hear that like one more time just to feel that because yeah. when you were saying inst- instant intimacy is a really good word here, a term to use for all of my white listeners who are scrambling because there's a, a scramble happen that's panic driven. Yeah. Yep. Part of it is business. Like I'm going to lose my business because people yep. think I'm racist. Yep. The other part of it is like personal shame or guilt around like, but I'm not racist. How do I prove it? Or, or I am, I don't know it. I don't, I don't want to go there. So this instant intimacy is this whole thing, follow 10 black people. And do, yep. and so I, I'm, I'm so glad you're saying this because I felt the reflex. Mm-hmm. I was like, I'm going to name every black lover I ever had. I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> why? Like what's what called me to <laughs> Like what's causing me to do? And so it's like this, this, this this shame mechanism. Yeah. And so I love that instant intimacy, how that doesn't actually do a thing. And actually Cynthia Wall says it's actually, she calls it a barrier. Mm. She says these are barriers, intimacy. So essentially, I think that the reason why, and we just have this as we're recording right now, like I just earlier, I, I, I was having the, the book club with them, the little webinar when I was interacting with them. And when I asked them this question, like the audience, um, they said, we think that they want an acquaintance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think the reason why they think that is because these POC anti-racism influencers, they do sort of like distance themselves and they say, be solidarity. We want you to be in solidarity with me, but we don't have to return the favor. Mm. It's a one-sided thing because we've been the victims of racism and we do not owe you anything, mm-hmm. which is true, right, mm-hmm. on a larger level. But my thing is, like, Louise, what kind of standard do we want? That's, that's what I'm trying to understand, too. Because like, when you say... What kind of standard do we want? Right. It's like, how can we reframe the, the, the trauma that causes racism with the same template of trauma that causes racism? And so if one person has to be in power, it's just going to swing the other way eventually, right? It is going to swing the other way. And so yeah. when you say that, I, I hear when there's a sentiment of, you know, we people of color have experienced this, this hatred, this pain, all these things being in, in just being uh, dismembered from society and so literally in so many ways uh we want you to deal with us now we're not going to deal with you like mm-hmm. to me that's a lineage trauma because mm-hmm. white people who are trying to heal racism mm-hmm. obviously aren't overt racist and i guess we mm-hmm. can talk about that mm-hmm. uh, if that's a lineage trauma like maybe three or four generations back mm-hmm. they might have been slave keepers mm-hmm. and then three or four generations back from the educators they might descend from slaves Mm -hmm. might mostly yeah Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. it's in the dna of our memory to have Mm -hmm. these reflexes just to the color of skin through that generational trauma Mm -hmm. and so i feel like to pull those two apart is what i'm so interested in like Mm -hmm. here's your generational trauma in your dna in your somatic unconscious responses Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. just like going up to a cliff you feel a a pain in your stomach if you have racist ancestors that's going to be somewhere in there it's going to be somewhere right and then there's the present that i'm not racist now what do i do I'm just curious what you say to that. So what that is with the intergenerational trauma, it has to do with, um, it really has to do with intergenerational uh, child abuse Mm. and neglect. Mm -hmm. 
So it's easy on the surface when people hear me say that and they think I'm just bypassing racism, just bypassing the injustice. So hear me out. I'm going to talk about every single detail about how this is connected. Great. Those who follow me on Instagram, you've seen the details, but I'm just going to say on the podcast, like, here are the details. Um, white people, when I, okay, in, in practice, in private practice, when I talk to white people about their childhood trauma, when we get into this discussion, a lot of white people actually are in a state of denial that they've been abused or neglected as children. Mm. In particular, white people have a lot more of a, in my experience, a denial of it. I find that compared, more compared to people of color. Compared to POC, yes. It's like, it's, it's almost like, well, it's not almost it's like saying, if I admit it, I'm not perfect and my family's not perfect. I would say I found the same thing. I never thought of that. I consistently have seen that since I've been doing uh, private practice, right? Before and and now with the Racism Recovery Center, I consistently see that. There is just this immediate, like, I don't want to talk about that because my parents gave me all my tangible support Mm -hmm. and that's really all I needed. But Mm -hmm. when you think about it, I mean, we live in a capitalist society where money is the focus, right? Mm -hmm. And if if, if, if one is to maintain white supremacy then there are so many aspects that need to appear perfect. Mm. The perfect family, the perfect money, the car, Mm. the house, the this, the that. And the white children uh, who now are kind of like basically we're doing the reparenting and therapy, right? (laughs) So like they're in my head, I'm like, these are white children and we're we're holding space for that child wound. Mm -hmm. They have felt the pressure of perfectionism, white supremacy from their family members. Like you have to have this money together. You have to have perfect mm. credit. You got to have this and you got, and the pressure that they receive is far more than what POC experienced about like that degree of perfection. Mm. It's like, I've never that, I mean, POC that I've worked with in, in therapy, they're a lot more kind of down to earth. Like they, mm. they've sat with some of those traumas. White people are like, oh no, I'm good. See, that, that is how, I mean, that's, I, again, I have to pause. That's really powerful. It's really powerful because again, being raised white, Mm -hmm. that's something in my own racism recovery. I haven't even considered like that upholding of white supremacy through denial of trauma, even like there's nothing wrong with me and my family. We're good. We're not like those people. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's really important. I think for everyone to hear for a moment, because I'm going in my, through my mind. I have a, I'm very lucky to have a mixed base of people and mm-hmm. everyone I've worked with who is of color right away be like, mama be me. Yep. Like no shame. There's yep. like, no shame. mama, mama yep. be my ass and I love her. And I'm like, awesome. Yep. <laughs> like it's right there. Yep. But I have to like wring it out of white people. A lot of white people. <laughs> it, yes, I've never thought of that. Oh man. Like when you do wow. the comparison, it is, it's like you're pulling teeth. To talk about, ch- and I have to be, of course, you know, I have to approach it very gently uh-huh, uh-huh. because white people are so resistant. Now, this was before I started the Racism Recovery Center. Nowadays, when when part of the screening process, I flat out tell them, like, within the screening process, one of the first questions I ask is, are you ready to explore childhood trauma? I flat mm-hmm. out ask that question in the intake mm-hmm. because we need to start right there because mm-hmm. that is where it's at. This is... Are you ready for that? Because if you're not ready for that, then it's just going to not like be, it's, it's not, things aren't going to work well. We're just not mm-hmm. going to be on the same page. Mm-hmm. It's just not going to be successful. I, I already know. Absolutely. It's just going to be a problem, you know? Um, but yes, white folks, they are, and it is this shame. That's why it's like pulling teeth because if you're not perfect, then it's like, and that really does speak to white supremacy. Absolutely. So this is like toxic masculinity. You you yes. can't deviate from from this or you're worthless. Yes. And yes. so POC can go through trauma and be abused and be like, you know what? But I'm not worthless because I've been beaten. I'm going to mm. still keep coming back with resilience. We're going to keep, you know, because we're very, unfortunately, it's been normalized. We're familiar with it. But white people have gone through that too. But the difference is they don't want to admit it. Yeah. They that, don't want to admit. Difference. Yeah. And that's the perfectionism. And that's the narcissism. Yeah. That's the I, narcissism because that's the numbing. I don't want to admit that, that I'm not perfect. Perfectionism, when you literally look at it in the DSM, although 
the white people I work with, I do not diagnose them with narcissistic personality disorder because they do not fit the criteria. Mm -hmm. Um, But when we look at those traits, though, perfectionism actually literally is in there. They they try to maintain like a perfect image. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so to me now, going back to intergenerational trauma, oh, this is such a good podcast. No one's ever asked me about the intergenerational trauma. Because I do go through that in the coaching. Oh, nice. Um, actually, later in the, like, what we're going to do later, you're going to love this. This is like, <laughs> like, this is like therapy porn. We Ooh. are going to be it. We are going to be doing genograms tracking this Excited. stuff. Excited. Excited. Yes. Oh, my goodness. My coaching clients are going to, they're going to enjoy that. But, but so it's like, you know, um, so the intergenerational trauma is child abuse and or neglect or not getting your needs met. And ignoring that in favor for really, and it is a lot of it, poverty trauma. Mm. Because when I interact with white folks, I've I've interacted with white folks who are Italian, Polish, Mm -hmm. whatever. And folks that weren't of like the British or German persuasion, but their ancestors came over. When they started interviewing their family members, like basically they like whitewashed themselves the moment they came over. Mm, like mm. in a British German way, mm. like Aryan race way. We are going to just say we're white and we're not Polish. We're not Italian. We're not, you know, Czech. We're not, you know, we're just white. Mm-hmm. So the moment they came over here, they lost a part of their own identity mm-hmm. from their family. And that's because they were racially discriminated, of course, when they came over. So mm-hmm. then we actually hold space for that. And when they interview like their family members, um, their own family members say, well, we did what we did because we need to survive. It's the adopting of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. The adopting of white supremacy. So they're like, we did what we had to do to survive. And as many of you know, back in the day, people get hung if you're white, if you're an abolitionist. Mm -hmm. You Mm -hmm. die. And that's also part of that trauma too, mm-hmm. because even to this day, if you're in a white space and if you try to get in that abolitionist mode around white people, you're going to mm-hmm. trigger them. And then it's going to upset these white people. And then they're going to go, we are going to now ostracize you and reject you from all financial accessibility. Mm-hmm. That's what we're going to do. We are going to cut you off. Okay. This is where the rate, I'm sorry. Yes. No, go, go ask me. But this is where the systemic racism comes in around poverty trauma. Yes. Because you're saying, because I even think of, um, I like that we're going in this direction because when we talk about the poverty trauma, mm-hmm. I think of my family. So uh, the white side of my family is Irish, right? Mm-hmm. Irish and French, mm-hmm. very poor. And when they came here, very poor and remained very poor for many, up until like, you know, even my generation, like my mother would grow up very poor. Mm-hmm. That family identified and was like the safe house for minorities. So they all came there. They all fed them. They all took care of the community. There was no like even idea of racism within that little bubble of my family because they were poor. Mm -hmm. My grandpa who came from Puerto Rico, Mm -hmm. much more racist Mm. because he adopted the white supremacy because how he looked and how he was treated when he came here, couldn't speak, all these things. So he adopted it and refused to have it be in our lives. He had shame. He wouldn't even cook the same Mm. food. He would cook his food in one skillet and our food in another skillet. Mm. So we weren't even allowed to have that. Literally segregating. Literally segregating. So when you say that, I'm like, he started valuing money, making a lot of money, feeling much more like the white man. Yeah. Took on that whole identity. And that's when we go into the model minority. Mm. Tell me about that. <laughs> That's when we go into the, 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 the idea of the model mi- minority, which mm-hmm. is the less. So why did, why would he do that? Because he mm-hmm. wants to be a peer, less confrontation threatening to white supremacy. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. It, it's amazing when you, when you said the poverty trauma that kicked in, I thought, the wow. Poverty trauma kicked in. Cause he was poor. He ate sugar cane on the plantation. <laughs> That's how he survived and came over here on a plane got a job with the army, experienced extreme racism for the first decade mm. until, he, until he proved himself to be white enough, I think. Yep. And yep. live that way to now. Yep. And so that racial discrimination that he experienced, so he, he was the victim of racial trauma plus mixed in, of course, with poverty trauma. Yeah. And um, 
that reminds me of like white passing black folks that this is like octoroons back then they're eighth you know you can't even they are just passing mm -hmm. you know and mm -hmm. a lot of that was done out of survival mm -hmm. because melanin was kind of like the mark of cane it was mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. if you are or or a uh, scarlet letter mm -hmm. you know you are marked and if you're marked you're no good mm -hmm. and you're damaged goods, you know, this whole, and it's racist, right? So it's like the dehumanization of a, an, you know, of another human being. Yeah. And um, so going back to the, so basically what a lot of my clients had discovered is that they, their families got very whitewashed because when you actually ask, if you actually ask a white person, you ask them, most white people in America, you say, okay, so what's your ethnicity? I'm white. No, 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 mm. no, no. That's not what I'm asking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, what is your, like, do you know your ethnic background? Like your mm. ancestors? They're like, actually, I never really even thought about it. Mm. Oh my goodness. No wonder, like, they, of course, they culturally appropriate, culturally racially appropriate. Mm. They've been expected to erase their ancestral identity from the beginning. Mm -hmm. From the beginning. Now, me growing up, I actually was taught blackness and I was uh, also taught my white side, both my ethnic backgrounds. I was taught Thanks. both. I was yeah, fortunate. Yeah. But that doesn't happen for everybody. And for and it shocked me when me as a black woman, I was shocked when I knew more about my whiteness on white side than white people who are just 100% white. I'm like, how do you not? Well, it, you know, and this is long before I started my work. And that's when I started to find out, oh, they don't know about their ancestors because this was the price that they paid to survive. Mm -hmm. This is the sabotage that they did. They, 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 this was the price they paid. Well, I want to make money and I want to be able to feed my baby. So I'm going to be white and that's it. And I'm going to erase all my ethnic background and assimilate into whiteness. And that's what I'm going to do. And um, is it fair to call that almost a cultural trauma? Like it you is had to, it you had is. to leave your culture. It is. It is. And my coaching clients have said that when they interview their family members, when they ask them about that, their family members respond like we're talking like grandparents and great grandparents. Actually, when they talk to them, even their parents, um, because if their grandparents aren't alive, then they ask their parents and then their parents tell them what their parents went through. And even when they talk about it, like there is shame in their tone. Mm. And it's just like shame or immediate dismissal. Like we had to do, we had to do very quickly. Mm. We don't talk. We don't want to talk about that. We don't talk about that. Now, can like, you tell the listeners why that's important <laughs> for white people? I'm making quotes right now. If you're listening, white mm -hmm. people to understand their cultural heritage to heal their own racism against, let's say, people of color. Tell us why that's important. Because it has to do with identity and it has to do with the fact that as a white person, if all you see yourself is just white, that really isn't all of who you are. Mm -hmm. That's putting yourself in a very narrow little box. Mm -hmm. It erases the complexity of your experience and as you basically you're talking is about ancestral memory mm -hmm. and so we're talking like that's erasing your own lineage to survive and what that does is that in your relationships and your understanding of yourself is disconnected mm. and that's not holistic that's not mm healthy that's like you there is a part of you that is disconnected and and it's disconnected because your ancestors came over and they may have come over poor and they sacrificed their identity which was traumatic because i bet you those folks i don't think anybody for the most part just wants to say i'm just going to get rid of my ethnicity especially if they came right from europe i don't think mm -hmm. that they are just like let's just i think they absolutely do it to for survival and and they had to to survive mm -hmm. and that was very traumatic and so unfortunately this gets normalized yeah, yeah it's so everything there's two words you just said are really important to me complexity mm -hmm. it, when you were talking i kept hearing complex complexity and 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 disintegration it's like a disassociation from your own cultural heritage there you go there's no no one's white 
it's That's like right. there's a, even there's white white tribes. You go back to Norway, there's tribal right. cultures. Right. So when we forget our heritage, the white person's racial trauma is just believing they're white. And then, and then the black people have to suffer for that belief because then the supremacy comes in. If there wasn't the belief survival. we were white. We, right. Out of survival. So right. white supremacy is all about, it's all about capitalism. Mm-hmm. Remember, black folks and other indigenous peoples, what was it about? It's always about money. Mm. Let's use some kind of identity discrimination to be able to exploit. Mm. So it's always connected to money. It's always connected to money. Mm-hmm. And so white people, the other thing that I know, student, I've never said this in a podcast. <laughs> so <laughs> this is just like, we were getting into some stuff here because oh, we're diving. Like, we're I've, diving also, I've also never seen anyone more terrified of poverty than white people. Mm. Oh, that's true. I mean, it is absolutely, I mean. That is true. I mean, POC, many of us come from poverty, not everybody, but but most of us, really a lot of us. And it's not, you know, we're like, okay, we came from poverty. We hold space for that. That's our, you know, we know that. Oh no, that's like a, oh, poverty. I don't want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Like really shaming. And I've seen white people too. Like, let's say if we're at a store, like at a grocery store, and let's say that they don't have enough money. I mean, they just go straight into a trauma response that they don't have enough money to pay completely, for something. Completely, completely. And I mean immediate trauma. It's shaming because it's like saying, I'm no one now. I'm no one. I have no mm-hmm. money. I'm no one without money. And like POC have had to, because of all the, you know, um, traumas that we've dealt with because of racism, we've had to learn how to be resilient and believe that we are somebody regardless of money. Mm-hmm. Whereas white people are like, we are nobody without money. See, so a lot of white I'm person's sorry. identity is wrapped into that exploitation and that money. And again, back to poverty trauma. So it's like saying, I'm not, I'm no one unless I have money. I'm no one unless I have these things because this is perfect, mm-hmm. connected to white supremacy. So, mm-hmm. so this is, so yeah, go. Mm-hmm. No, that, oh, I'm just, I'm getting chills. Like I'm getting chills specifically when you say, People of color have built resilience to see they're more than not having money or more than money even. I got chills there because I just know that from people I've been around and with and clients. And I'm I'm in this study group around, you know, racism recovery with this book that we're working with. And one of the one of the and I'm doing quotes again, one of the white guys came up and he said, uh, how do you say it? I don't feel safe unless I'm with black people. And then he said, Actually, I don't feel safe unless I'm with traumatized people. And I thought that was so <laughs> like powerful because what I've experienced from people of color who are consistently traumatized you know, by everything they see on TV about them and just the way they're looked at and what their family has told them, what's in their bones from being you know, shipped over here, there's so much mm-hmm. is resilience, so mm-hmm. much resilience. Mm-hmm. And traumatized people who have done the work Mm-hmm. regardless of color, resilience. So there's this amazing resilience amongst people that work with their trauma mm-hmm. that I experience tend to come, white people, let's say, who work on the trauma, they come out and they don't have that same even covert racism that a white person that hasn't worked on the trauma has. And I'm curious about your take on that because what I see with that is the sense of vulnerability mm-hmm. and, and finding power in the vulnerability mm-hmm. versus white people seeing their vulnerability as a really shameful thing and then projecting that onto people of color. So what I will first say is that I would disagree with you only because this is my specialty. I never, I never assume that a white person doesn't act in covert ways unless I assess them myself Mm -hmm. because I have found that, and that's the tricky thing about covert racism. Mm -hmm. It's actually so ridiculously subtle. Can you tell us about that so we can, Tell us oh all about that. God. Yes, it's so subtle. And <clears throat> covert racism is so painful for POC uh, because it's a sneak attack. And it's most of the time not even intentional. It's unintentional, but it's a sneak attack. And so what happens is, is that white people over time, especially white liberals, they have really mastered like appearing like they're not racist because they they, they see 
so many examples of overt racism from the KKK mm-hmm. and all this other stuff. And they learn these old rules. This is how you act. This is how you shouldn't act. This and that. And I'm just not going to act that way so that I won't be a threat mm-hmm. to a person of color. Mm-hmm. The problem is, is that that only works when you're not in an intimate relationship with a POC. Because once you actually dive into a deeper intimacy with a POC, the performative allyship no longer becomes sufficient. So performative allyship tends to work with kind of like strangers, like etiquette. You meet somebody, you know, you're going to behave yourself. You're going to, you know, that doesn't work well in intimate relationships. So all that superficiality. So white people have essentially learned. So I'm going to connect this to Cobra in a second. So like (laughs) white people have essentially learned performative allyship and Performative allyship, and I talked about this on Instagram the other day, and I always like kind of slowly reveal things in my Instagram. People get shocked, like, what? Like, I thought this was the what? It's even deeper, like, because it's very deep. Yeah. And so, like, I can't just reveal everything in one pop because it's just a lot to unpack. It's a lot to unpack, right? And so I just want to give everyone little piecemeals, right? So mm-hmm. the thing is, and this is the, the shadow, this is a true shadow of performative allyship. It's an addiction. Because narcissists are addicted. So this is when we get into the covert. Because we need to mix all this in. Mm. So the covert is codependency. Codependency is narcissism. The numbing. And the codependent, and you know from the literature, from back from the beginning, codependency was always connected to addiction. Right? Except everyone thinks like, oh, the codependent is the victim and the narcissist is the bad one. No, they're both in a symbiotic relationship of narcissism, which is the numbing. Each of them works together because they're both numbing. They just do it in a different kind of way where they're soothing each other and numbing their own pain instead of self-soothing and, you know, having that sense of self-worth within as well as personal empowerment, right? So it's a power dynamic going on. Codependency starts in childhood. Mm -hmm. Codependency means as a child, you were told you're a burden, you're needy, stop bothering me. That's just like a simple way of kind of get out of here. But the child actually has legitimate needs that need to be met. Mm-hmm. And the child then goes, you know what? My, my parents are telling me or caregivers are telling me it's all in my head. I actually don't have needs and I'm just being really, I'm being a burden and it's all in my head. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So then what happens? What happens is, is that the child then gets in narcissism. They numb their pain. We talked about dissociation. Mm -hmm. So you got that layers of white person in that codependency. On top of that, they're also, so this is with white families, for example. Then what they're learning is white supremacy. Now, what is that? Because it's like, what, is going on here because racism is learned it is but what keeps it alive and well is that trauma Mm -hmm. so white people learn racism because it's just like how we're socialized so white people especially in mostly white communities if they're racially segregated which most are they learn to socialize with white people but they never learn to socialize with poc Mm -hmm. and when they don't learn to socialize with poc it means that they're going to act in more racist ways. They're just not socialized to interact with POC because if you socialize, if you are socialized to interact with POC, you're going to feel comfortable talking about racism. That's just like, you're going to be comfortable talking about racism because racism for POC, I mean, that happens all the time, right? That's a really good way to put it for everyone listening. Like you're comfortable talking about racism if you're socialized to interact with POC. Yes. So if you're, so what really unfortunately undermines a white person's ability uh, to f- hold space for the emotional pain with POC is if you're not socialized with POC, you're also not socialized to hold space for the pain that you're witnessing of their racism. Mm. You're not mm-hmm. even like around that. Mm. So when white people are like, I don't know why I can't just like, not, why am I acting white and fragile? Well, boo, because you've probably been around white people your whole life and you've never from, even from your childhood been socialized with uh, with POC, mm. you've never actually witnessed your buddy 
go through racism and then you are intimate with them and then yeah. for the pain that they're experiencing. Like you have zero experience in that. You're literally talking about building the capacity to witness and hold someone else's discomfort and trauma response and experience. And that's where the addiction and performative allyship come together because it, it, it relieves you of a little bit of that. Like, well, yes. that was, that's yes. amazing. So the performative allyship is like a, it's a poor substitute for actually generally holding emotional space. Mm. So the thing is, is that a lot of white people are burning out right now. Yeah. Watching everything on television. Seeing what's going on. And then PC are like, well, you need to like be solid. You need, we go through, you just need to consist. It's like, folks, I'm sorry, but like, White people are not, especially if they're in all white neighborhoods, are not going to snap and just suddenly be like reliable and not burn out. Mm -hmm. What you're expecting of them, it's, it's an unreasonable emotional expectation. They've never actually been around enough POC to understand and hold space for the type of trauma that you're going through as a POC. Mm -hmm. So Can I ask you a question there before yeah. I forget? Because yeah. based on what you said, because yeah. you disagreed with what I said and I'm, yeah. I'm realizing why. Mm -hmm. I want to. I want to just re reframe it and see if this is more accurate. Okay. They, a, a, let's say, a white person may not stop being covert racist. May may not stop acting in a way as covert, covertly racist. But if they've worked with their own trauma and they've created resilience for trauma, they can probably handle the trauma of a POC yeah, so experience. They can, right. That's. I think that's a good way. That's to what I was. That's why I want to say that. Yes, because I do notice that white people who have actually, who are trauma informed and they have done some processing where they themselves have experienced some degree of trauma recovery, mm -hmm. they are able to hold more space for POC. However, what happens is, is that uh, actually they, uh, they underestimate the degree and severity of the trauma that POC go through. Because you had mentioned earlier, like, gosh, you know, like I'm a therapist and, you know, I've gone through my own stuff and like, um, but then I felt myself getting triggered and, and feeling like I had to perform. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, that's because the degree of suffering and pain that POC go through is nothing com as far as racial identity. Yeah. It's nothing compared to what POC go through. So Absolutely. it's like the level of discrimination. So like I've, I've said on Instagram before, it's like, um, the higher you go up and closer and closer to cis white male, the more brainwashed you are in white supremacy. As bell hooks would say, you know, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy, the more brainwashed you are in that, and you have to live by that perfect standard. The, the, the lower and lower and lower and lower you go in that, right. The fur, in other words, the further you get from that, white supremacist, capitalist, patriarchy. You actually have, what I've noticed, is a greater capacity to hold space for POC's pain. Mm. And I'll tell you why. Because when you're different and have been discriminated, you can understand to a degree at least what discrimination feels like. That is the reason why queer folks, women, why people who are, who are not white, because you're not gonna see cis white males on the front lines for the most part you are not going to see that yeah and it's not because they're such horrid evil people it's because they feel like they have to fit into that box all yep. of their sense of self-worth is in that toxic masculinity box and if they step out of it they're going to get a reprimand immediately in their communities i mean they are like i don't want to lose my my privilege i don't want to mm -hmm. i don't want to get that feedback i'm going to get judged i'm going to so in a way they kind of in a way of course, they experience their own level of judgment. I mean, I mean, among their own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And those of us who are further and further and further and further away from that, we're able to hold space for some degree of understanding of discrimination. See, that's right? powerful because there's a big difference. I'm learning this right now with you. There's a really big difference of the capacity and experiential empathy to hold space for someone who's being discriminated against versus not acting racist in a covert way. Yes. Because now, I'm so curious about that. Because that's the difference between actual authenticity versus. Yeah. 
Yes. You pretty much hit it on the, you pin the tail on Baki right there. Yeah. That's the difference. So I'm really curious, um, as a black woman. Yes. And as a therapist that works with a lot of um, white people who want coaching to stop being covert racists. Mm -hmm. Which ways are most common but most unseen for white people to hear right now of how they're acting covertly or even thinking in a racist way? Because uh, unco covert, when I hear covert, I just want to say the word unconscious. Mm -hmm. so people really get yes. how yes. asleep you are to it. It's not yeah. you're not trying it. It's not who you are. It's not your identity. Yes. Can you give us some like signs? Denial. Like, what's look denial? intellectualization those two racist defense mechanisms are so when you're looking for symptoms you're looking for racist defense mechanisms and the reason why it's so covert and so unintentional is because it's connected to that dissociation so the problem mm -hmm. is is that you're not going to know that you're going into a trauma response because also, you've been taught, most white people have been taught, they actually, so it's simultaneous. I want everyone to listen and understand it's simultaneous. So, so this is how it works. Like, so white people have already had their own history of childhood stuff, right? We'll add that to the little box right there. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so they, they're already, the, 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 the ground is nice and laid out for narcissistic behavior. You already got that foundation right there. That's probably mm -hmm. unresolved, unattended, hasn't been looked at. Because we can't say our parents are bad. We can't, we don't want to, you know, we, we try to avoid that shame like the plague. Mm -hmm. So that already sets up the bed nice and easy for narcissistic behavior. Then why people learn the racism, which is a very specific type of narcissism, right? Because sexism is another type of narcissism. Yeah. Yeah. Ableism is another type of narcissism, right? And so specifically with the racism, it is what, what I have consistently experienced in coaching my clients they say, my, I watched, first they think, for, this always happens. I'm nothing like my parents. My parents do not want to hold space like for their racism and the ways they've been taught. They think I, I'm so much more woke than them. Then when we start tracing the racist defense me mechanisms, they're like, oh my God, I learned that from my mother. And they realize that it just was packaged in a different little way. Mm -hmm. In other words, <laughs> in other words, they think they're more woke <laughs> because their parents are not as good of performers. Ooh, ooh! So the parents are more authentic. <laughs> yeah, that's funny enough, oh my but it's goodness. not funny. The yeah, parents yeah. are actually authentically yes. racist. Yes, yes. And then they think they're woke because they're better before. Oh, I'm so much well better read. I know oh, how to amazing. say exactly the right thing. I'm so good. And that's white liberals. I'm so glad you just said that because I think of <laughs> It's funny, think, but it's not funny. You know, I, I know oh, you know what totally. I'm talking about. No, it's my funny. people will be laughing with us. No, it's like, because yeah. uh, I like that you said the white liberals and the piece about the authentic parents because yeah. a lot of my white liberal clients are saying this to me. They're saying yeah. like, I don't know how to be authentic. So I'm afraid if I'm authentic, I'll lose my clients. I'll lose my yeah. customer base. No one will buy my product. And that's why they're not authentic. Perform. Right. So right. we need to learn. So that's why they, guess what? That's why they hire diversity, equity, inclusion people. Mm. That's why they hire all these people. I checked it. it. <laughs> I've done it. Now I know how to perform so I don't lose my business. And that's oh, why these I people love are it. making money. So that's why I don't have a million followers. Because <laughs> uh, no, I, I get it. Well, yeah, you know, I'm, <laughs> no, I'm not please. teaching people performance. And so yes. that's not what they want. So white people don't actually mm. want authenticity unless they're fairly trauma informed. People who love my work have, let's say they're recovering addicts. Like they want to maintain sobriety. Like they're, they're people have been through some serious traumas mm. or they, they're very trauma informed. They've done some of their work. They're working on their work. They, experience some trauma recovery and whatnot. But you know, what's really funny. And this is coming back to what you said about my folks who, if they've experienced trauma recovery, then it's sort of like, in a way, it's like asking, well, what's left? How? Mm -hmm. I've had mm -hmm. so many white people that go, I've been going to therapy for years. I've healed. A, I've gone to EMDR. You know, I've done EMDR. I've done somatic experiencing. I've done all these things, you know, whatever. And how come when we talk, there are parts that have not been addressed. I thought I had nipped it on the bud in therapy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's because 
white supremacy is taught and what this does is that if it blinds a white person it blinds people to emotional maturity mm -hmm. and they haven't socialized with poc they don't know how to have intimate relationships with poc and so it's a part of them that has not matured and this is the reason why when they come to anti-racism spaces they feel like children and in a way they kind of are mm -hmm. and that's what takes them back to the childhood trauma i'm ending part one there childhood trauma childhood trauma is the foundation of our nervous systems childhood trauma is the foundation of our belief systems how we see the world how we see ourselves what we expect from other people childhood trauma is where we develop all of that so april's work taking us back to understanding what did i experience in childhood who taught me racism who taught me sexism who taught me that this is how i go into the world this work is not to blame your ancestors or blame your parents that would just be taking the responsibility off of you it's to understand it's to have some compassion for yourself to say wow i wasn't born like this i'm learning i'm waking up to the foundation to the whys to the hows that my mind works this way that my body works this way the reason why i find april's work so important is if you are a white person or a black person or again any color in between the spectrum you may find yourself in an anti-racist circle in the world in your relationship watching the tv on instagram you may find yourself getting triggered by your race by the opposite race by anything that trigger remember is a reminder to your nervous system it's an external stimulus that tells the nervous system something bad's going to happen this is a reminder the body is remembering something a time when something bad happened and this is where lineage trauma is so important because three or four generations ago your ancestors could have had ex not even could have most likely in america had very very uh powerful racialized trauma and that gets passed down through dna so things that you experience today in your body you might not have context for but it's there it comes from somewhere unknown a mystery somewhere in the past this is so important because if we're not looking at trauma when we're involving racism recovery work we're freezing we're fighting we're flighting we're fawning we're getting triggered in these circles we're getting triggered when we go in with really pure intentions to heal uh, a racist ideology or action or behavior or system why that is so important is because when we are triggered our minds are closed and our hearts are closed we cannot learn we cannot transform and we cannot grow or heal because the wound won't even open up to be healed because we're defending it with a trauma response so if you find yourself getting going into a trauma response or you're an educator or a facilitator in these circles and you see trauma response that's your cue to say this is the moment to heal let's get through the trauma response so we can understand what's the body defending what's the body hiding or covering up what is being clenched what is hiding behind this person's fear if you don't know how to see a trauma response then either do some good trauma training or some good trauma reading I strongly recommend two books, The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk and My Grandmother's Hands by Resma Menachem. These are two incredible books that uh, explain the somatics of trauma. Follow April's work, follow my work, you'll learn a lot more about trauma response. 
I'm a somatic therapist, so my healing modalities are holistic. I'm not trained in clinical psychology like April is. So she comes from a different background of being informed. However, both of our trauma trainings and backgrounds bring us to this understanding of how the body holds trauma and what it does with it. Her specialty is race, and so is Resma Menachem's in my grandmother's hands. They both are trauma therapists who uh, specialize in racialized trauma. Again, it's important to understand how to see a trauma response because it means the person is overwhelmed with energy and is freezing, fighting, flighting, or fawning. And when you're able to see that, you're able to notice the difference between performative progress and actual healing. Thank you so much for the courage to listen and to do this work. And please share this. April did this for free. That's how important it is for her. I do this for free. That's how important it is for me. So review, rate, share, send to people who might need to hear this. I will leave you with a short clip from the second part of our interview where we go into the somatics and the trauma responses around racism a bit more. There's a difference between actually knowing POC versus what you see on television and what you, that's not real. Correct. And so that's not intimacy, but it's perceived relationship in the brain. Yes. As we know, what we see on TV, the brain can't tell the difference, right? So as always, before you go, take a breath, <sighs> feel your body, notice your emotions, and take that awareness into your life. I want to thank you for sharing this space with me. For more information on my work or any events that I might be hosting, please visit holisticlifenavigation.com. And you can find me on Instagram or Facebook at Holistic Life Navigation.